So welcome everyone uh, to the uh, 2024 version of the 350 New Mexico Legislative Action Training Webinar. And what we're going to be doing uh, tonight is sharing uh, our plans for the 2024 legislative session in New Mexico and the climate and energy bills, a uh, piece of legislation that we know of so far um, that we will be supporting with, uh, I think, one one piece of opposition, and um, then taking you through the resources that we're going to have on our webpage and the legislative um, uh, website, et cetera. And so with that, uh, I'm going to use this um, slide deck to take you through the material, and we will post these slides as well. Um, and so this is it, and here we go. So my name is Tom Solomon, and uh, with me is Jim McKenzie. We are the co-coordinators of 350 New Mexico, the New Mexico chapter of 350.org. Um, and uh, those are our uh, two emails if you want to contact us. Uh, what we're going to cover this afternoon is... Uh, uh, process overview of how the legislature works, the resources that we're going to uh, make available on our web page, um, and then uh, some tips on how to attend legislative hearings, uh, speak hopefully in favor of the bills that we're trying to uh, help pass in the session or attend by webcast, the communications that we're going to make available, uh, the preliminary list of climate and energy bills that we know of, uh, just a brief description, then we should have some good time for Q&A. And um, that's the material. Um, I'm going to cover uh, the first half of this page, and then Jim will cover uh, the second on the legislative process. But uh, on the left side here, you can kind of see an image of what the top of the New Mexico legislature's website looks like. Um, and you can find it at uh, nmlegis.gov. Um, it is a very, very good and well-organized and uh, substantive website. So all sorts of good stuff. You want to know who your legislator is. You can click on legislators, uh, all of the committees that are meeting. Uh, you can see them there. Track the bills under the legislation. Uh, the one ha what's happening tab is a good one if you want to know, like, uh, what are the committees that are going to be meeting uh, that day or an upcoming day. So We'll take you through a lot of this uh, during the course of the webinar today. Uh, just in terms of the dates that the legislature is meeting, um, it kicks off on January 16th, but legislation can be pre-filed uh, from the 2nd through the 12th. So we are about halfway through the pre-filing session. And this will be a 30-day session, a short session this year. So it goes from January 16th and it ends at noon on February 15th uh, with the 31st of January, the last day you can introduce a bill. And uh, that is, um, you know, it goes quickly, um, with these 30-day sessions, and uh, we hope to get some good work done. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bill, or to, uh, to Jim, rather, to talk about how a bill becomes law. Jim. Uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, thanks for that brief introduction. Uh, yeah, so part of tracking legislation is understanding the process, understanding some of the lingo. For instance, what does pre-file mean? So the way a bill is introduced is a bill sponsor uh, has a draft, uh, has a bill that's been through a drafting process that usually involves the legislative council service. They have professional bill drafters and they take the, the ideas that the legislator wants in the bill and they craft it into um, legislative language, which is this kind of le semi-legalese, uh, which is uh, interesting uh, lingo in of itself. Um, the other thing that happens at that point is the bill uh, gets sent out uh, to different, um, I guess you'd call them uh, cabinet secretaries or different departments 
uh, in the in the government uh, to get uh, their read of the impact. So there's a um, an impact statement that that um, isn't immediate, but it, it comes along soon after the bill is introduced, and that is very valuable to the legislators and everybody else. Uh, the analysis um, to to tell what the bill actually does, and also there's a fiscal impact which. Uh, talks about exactly what it sounds like the um, either the cost or the revenue impact uh, to the state budget. Um, this is this is a uh, it's it's not a quite an objective process. Uh, so it's helpful to read it carefully. And one of the things we do is go through these impact statements and and see um, if there's bias in them, which happens sometimes. And and uh, so we can make note of that. And that's one of the things we talk about um, the next step, which is committee hearings. So the a bill is introduced and then the leadership in the House or Senate, depending on where it's introduced, assigns it to committees. So if it's a House bill, it's assigned by the speaker and uh, if it's if it's the Senate, it's the Senate pro tem who has uh, ability to assign it to one committee, two committees, three committees is usually a death sentence. So there's a lot of power in the legis uh, in the leadership on you know whether it's going to go to a friendly committee, a hostile committee, uh, and the number of committees. So that's kind of all happens. Uh, it's an opaque process that all happens behind the scenes. Uh, but then when the, when you go on to the legislative um, website and you look up a piece of legislation, it will have the uh, committee assignments, where it's going, where it is, and where it's going. Um, so, you know, this is a, the, this isn't an entirely linear process. Uh, and for for the the path that I'm talking about here, uh, I, I'm not going to go on forever. But um, there's there's a typical path, and then there's an atypical path, and then there's a path that some types of bills take and other types of bills don't take. Uh, for instance, there's a whole separate way that proposed constitutional amendments are handled, et cetera, et cetera. So these are just general. Uh, general guidelines. Okay, so we have, um, let's say, and then I will also say that most of the time, a bill is introduced either in the Senate or the House, and, and oftentimes that's determined by who is carrying the bill, who's sponsoring the bill, whether it's a senator or a representative. But bills can be introduced in both, in both chambers. And, and we'll get a little bit more to that later. So, so bills uh, are assigned to a House, uh, or let's say a House committee, just for purposes of argument. And then the chairperson of that committee uh, schedules the bill for a hearing or doesn't schedule the bill for a hearing. That happens too. <laughs> uh, so if there's hostility, um, the bill will never be heard. So this is a, you know, uh, but let's say it's going to be heard. So then the committee um, has a, a meeting and that's all that information is published when it's going to be heard. And that hearing in front of the committee is a public process. And this is one of the, actually the neat things about our legislature. Uh, we have a very open uh, largely open hearing process when all of us uh, can can attend those hearings and be heard. Um, uh, most of the time, uh, the chairperson goes out of their way uh, to make enough time uh, to hear most everybody, uh, you know, short and to the point. Um, but before the public gets to comment, there's usually a, a small panel of experts uh, oftentimes the sponsor of the bill 
and a couple of their experts. Um, uh, Tom has done this on, on several occasions. Um, so you sit at a table and you make a presentation to the committee and you field uh, um, questions from the committee. And if the committee is interested to in drilling down in it, um, they do that at that point. And then following the expert panel, uh, that's when the, there's a public comment session. session. And it's important. Uh, we can all be cynical about this, but the public comments um, and a number of us on, on this call, I'm sure, uh, have done this. Uh, we're, we're listened to, one, and two, uh, the aggregate uh, for and against is tallied, and that that also has an impact. So um, a number of times I've been in committees, and it'll be let's say a industry some industry friendly bill, and but the consumers don't like it. So you'll have typically the people who work for the industry testify for the bill, one or two people, and everybody else in the room testifies against it. So, or, or makes public comment against it. And th those kinds of things uh, carry weight for, uh, for the House or Senators who are listening to the debate and need to uh, figure out what, what the weather's like, which way is the wind blowing on this bill? Um, you know, uh, is this seemingly a popular bill or it's not popular? And that might inform how they vote. So committee hearings, are uh, interesting in of themselves, but they're also impactful um, because of the public input. And uh, we'll go over later, uh, you know, you can do this, they now have hybrid. So you can do this uh, on Zoom or in person. Uh, oftentimes they alternate, but um, as with everything else, you know, there's more impact with in-person. I, I don't think there's much uh, discuss, uh, debate about that. So if you have something that you're passionate about, um, make, make an up, make, uh, an excuse. Uh, I mean, the rail runner, uh, runs up and there's a bus from the rail runner station, um, to the roundhouse. It's very accessible. Um, you know, there's coffee shop and restaurants. And if you haven't done that, uh, it's, it's a, it's a neat experience. Okay, so so we have a committee hearing, and then there's a vote at the committee, and the and so the committee um, either passes the bill, passes along, or it doesn't. And um, so if they pass the bill, then that vote is recorded, and the bill goes on to the next committee hearing again. This is uh, this order is decided in the case of the House by the Speaker of the House. So let's just jump forward and assume that that my bill has gone, uh, been passed, uh, has got a due pass from its two assigned committees, and then it goes to the floor for a vote. And again, the Speaker and and his staff, uh, his clerk, and everything. They schedule that, and, and then there's a debate on the floor that oftentimes uh, is reminiscent of the debates that happened in the committee hearings, um, and then, uh, then there's a vote. So if the, if the bill is passed on the floor, then it, what they call, they go, it, they, it crosses over, and that means it goes to the other chamber, and and the, the process is repeated, uh, including with a floor action. Uh, so the other thing that ha sometimes happens in the committees is not sometimes, often, um, a bill will be uh, amended. There'll be a problem with the bill or there'll be something that's not um, someone, let's say, I like the bill, but I don't like this paragraph, so... Uh, the sponsor will say, sure, I will take a friendly amendment and I will change this or, or a hostile amendment and then there's a vote. So it's entirely possible 
and again, this is where things get more and more complicated, that the bill that crosses over is not the bill that was introduced exactly, or the bill crosses over and it was an amendment, but by the time it gets through uh, the other chamber, it has been amended. So it came, the bill A was, came out of committee, went to a floor vote, then went over to the other chamber, was changed, but now is not the same bill, I mean, exactly the same. It has to be exactly the same as was passed on the floor originally of the other chamber. So then there's a process where uh, before the bill um, uh, becomes law, those two differences, two different bills have to be reconciled. And that's that's a whole process in of itself. So um, that's basically, uh, you know, the way it works. If the bill is then reconciled, um, then it goes to the governor for a vote, uh, for, a, for her signature or her veto or her pocket veto. And uh, this is an interesting part uh, of, of New Mexico uh, legislation is that um, the governor is very is more powerful in New Mexico vis-a-vis -vis the legislature than in a lot of other states. So the New Mexico state constitution uh, says that if the if the governor vetoes a bill, um, he or she has to explain her veto. And uh, and this is helpful because if someone wants to fix it next session, they can. Um, and, and, and this, uh, you might remember under uh, Susana Martinez, um, she vetoed, uh, I don't remember, two or three bills and didn't have an explanation. Uh, and the court uh, invalidated her veto and those laws uh, became, those bills became law uh, with her, without her signature. But there's, there's another loophole, or there is a loophole, and that is the pocket veto. And that's where um, there is a deadline for the governor to sign the bill or veto it. But if, if the governor doesn't take any action at all, uh, that's called, that's the same as a veto. It's called a pocket veto. And unlike a regular veto, the pocket veto doesn't require an explanation. Uh, and I think we're gonna see a constitutional amendment um, in this session uh, to fix that. So the governor takes some of that power away from the governor to, um, to veto a bill without explanation. That, that's um, not really consistent with the spirit of the Constitution. So I probably went on much too long. Um, I can answer questions about this process, maybe, um, when we get to the Q&A. So thank you. So Tom, you uh, ready to go or should I yes. go some more? I, I just had to unmute myself. Okay. Uh, so thank you, Jim, uh, good overview. And uh, let's proceed with the rest of the slide deck, um, which I just, here there you go. You still seeing that everybody? Yep. Okay, so um, this is our website and I just wanted to, show you uh, where things will be located. Uh, 350newmexico.org is our website. And uh, right, our purpose with this coming session is to pass uh, help pass a number of good bills. <clears throat> Those bills are listed on our website uh, in this tab. So if you go to 350newmexico.org, you uh, look at these various pull down menus across the top, you see one called New Mexico Climate Action. Click it, and then you will see a link at the top called Climate and Energy Bills 2024. Click that to launch that particular web page. 
and then you will see something that includes this kind of text. So it explains, you know, the legislative session and has various links to, you know, signing up to volunteer, um, clicking here to uh, see these training slides uh, and a recording. Uh, there's a listing of committees um, that um, we have maintained with contact information for each of the legislators, phone numbers, emails, and in some cases, their X or Twitter accounts um, and the committee schedules. And then the list of the bills that we will be supporting, which I'll show you on the next page. So this is going to be the main um, resource that 350 New Mexico will offer to help us coordinate our activities in support or opposition of the key climate energy bills in the session. 350NewMexico.org under New Mexico Climate Action. This is um, the list preliminarily of what we have visibility into so far of these bills. I'm going to come back to that. I just wanted to show you, but we'll end up with a bit of a discussion about what some of these bills are, but that's what we know of so far. Committee contact information uh, is at that link that I just showed you. And if you... Um, click on that link or from this particular slide deck, you click on where it says um, view committees, you will get this Google doc right here and it'll show um, each of the main committees that uh, we will be dealing with. This one happens to be an example of the Senate Conservation Committee, abbreviation SCONC. And you will see, you know, the members of the committee with the chair at the top um, and their capital phone number, email where you can contact them. And if they have a Twitter or X account, uh, that's where we list here. Of course, Twitter is uh, not as um, broadly used as it was a year ago uh, because of various things that have gone on. But that's the information that we have. And I think for the purposes of the legislature and um, interacting with them, um, that is probably still the best kind of social media to you. So uh, committee contact information, again, you can see uh, at this link under view committees, all of this kind of information, you scroll down and you'll get lots of the other committees. And then if you want to see the committee schedules, you can click on a link called view schedules. If you want to send, and we encourage people to do this, send an email to legislators uh, advocating for or against a bill. Uh, it is always good to include the actual name and number of the bill in the subject line because legislators tend to review their email comments and sort them by the bill number. So if you put the bill number in the subject line, makes it real easy for them. So, you know, for example, please vote yes on HB 42 would be a good subject line to send in this example to Senator Bill Sewell. So that's a good tip. Um, for attending the committee hearings, as Jim just uh, explained, uh, this, is, um, this is where you can find good information on how to do that. So they have, for the last couple of years, broadcasted their committee hearings on Zoom as well as webcast. And I'll explain the difference between those uh, shortly. If you want to attend on Zoom and deliver your public comment as a Zoom comment, that's the way to do that. So um, I will show you on a committee schedule example where you can get information about how to attend by Zoom. But it is um, very powerful to have people show up in the committee room itself or on Zoom if you can and uh, say your piece why you support that bill or in some cases why you oppose it. Uh, they've been doing it on Zoom for the last couple of years. I expect them to do it again because it is just so popular. Uh, the procedures for the House and the Senate may differ a little bit, uh, but largely um, they're pretty similar and well-established procedures now. Uh, if you want to see what the committee schedule is and what the session calendar for that committee looks like, go across the top of the page 
on the legislative website and click on what's happening. And then you'll get a page where it'll have a link to the session calendars. Click on that. And then you can see, you know, percent of conservation committee, for example, the listing of bills that they will have scheduled in their next hearing and when and where that next hearing uh, will occur. Um, you can uh, sign up in advance uh, to, uh, to attend on Zoom or show up in the committee room itself. If you just want to attend the webcast and view the committee without having any interaction, that's what this webcast link is for. And you click on that and it'll show you which committees are um, being webcast live and you'll just click on that and pull it up on your browser and you'll be able to watch and hear the committee uh, as they go through their hearing. This is an example of a committee schedule. This happens to be from a couple of years ago, but still pretty typical. Um, so this happens to be an example for the Senate Conservation Committee. Uh, Liz Stefanics is still the chair and it shows you where you can get and see the webcast. It shows you the date, the, the day and the date and the time of the hearing um, and the listing of the bills in the order that they plan to hear them. Uh, they don't always adhere to their plan, but this is what they, this is the order that they think they will hear the bills. It, uh, you know, this is Senate Bill 8. Uh, the main title of the bill and the primary sponsor. And um, they will go through each of those, um, those bills. At the bottom, you will see this little paragraph highlighted in red. For public participation, send an email for the agenda items to this, legis to this uh, email address. And this one happens to be sconc at nmlegis.gov. So Senate Conservation Committee, that's what SEONC means. It goes to the administrative um, uh, helper for that committee, give them their name, who you're representing, the bill number for or against, and send them an email by the time deadline that they list. And you'll get a confirmation that you can attend by Zoom and deliver your comment in that way. Um, and that's all very useful. And this, the, they're pretty good about this and they really do welcome public comment. So that's how that works. And you can get this information again on the legislative website under what's happening, um, session calendars or in view committees, or you can just click on the committee's sec tab itself. During the session, uh, we will pro provide periodic email blasts uh, to the listing that we have on our distribution list with information on how the session is going, maybe uh, some priorities that we think really need to be emphasized, um, and just to communicate the tools that we have available for interacting and supporting the bills uh, in the committee. Our webpage will be live and it'll be updated every evening with the latest bill and committee information. Um, and so we have a couple of volunteers who graciously agreed to do that. Anna Lynn and Beth Goodbrenson, I think uh, they're on the meeting here tonight. Thank them very much. Um, and that's, uh, that's a good hour's worth of work uh, every evening, <laughs> somewhere around 6.30 p.m. To, to make it updated so that it's by the end of the night, uh, we have fresh information and you know what the committees um, are gonna hear uh, in the following day. This is a quick summary of the top bills that we are aware of um, in, in the climate and energy space. Again, this is the full listing uh, that we have so far, but I summarized it here just so we didn't go through every single one. Um, there look like will be three geothermal resource development bills. Again, unfortunately, the governor uh, vetoed the bills, pocket vetoed the bills last session. We believe that's been sorted out and that we will be able to get these through the legislature uh, again this, this session. So the main geothermal resource development bill by Senator Ortiz E. Pino. Um, and then there will be two companion bills that are related to that. 
a geothermal energy tax credit, also from the senator, and another third bill to uh, provide tax credits for ground source heat pumps, and that'll be from Senator Souls. Uh, another bill that's a lot of fun, uh, fully support, is called the School Bus Modernization Act, but it's really about electric school buses, Representative Saranyana, and it's a bill to provide tools and some funding to help school districts replace stinky old polluting diesel school buses with clean electric school buses. And that's good for health, it's good for the climate, um, and all around a good thing. So. Uh, that's a good bill to look for. Uh, the third category is a number of reforms to the Oil and Gas Act. Uh, there are actually three separate bills, all introduced by Representative Saranyana. Uh, and they do things like increase the bonding requirements so that abandoned wells uh, have sufficient uh, bond funds available to cap those, those uh, abandoned wells after they're done. Uh, put some uh, additional penalties uh, for uh, oil and oil spills and establishes some setbacks around schools where uh, school children are, are going and attending school so they don't have to breathe the toxic fumes that come out of those oil, um, oil rigs. So those are the oil and gas act reforms. Uh, this bill was introduced last year, didn't make it all the way through, but it's the climate and public health Resilience Bill to fund a Department of Health-based climate and public health program. Very important. Representative Thompson and Senator Stefanics. Um, there were a number of solar or there are a number of tax credits that um, were passed last year uh, that we, that again, were pocket vetoed, line item vetoed in this case, uh, that we will bring back. Um, so there's an electric vehicle tax credit there's a couple of energy storage, grid storage tax credits, and there's a bill to increase the, the monetary cap on the solar um, rooftop solar tax credit because uh, people installing rooftop solar systems end up um, oversubscribing the $8 million available per year um, about halfway through the year. So we want to bump that up. And then there are additional good bills. I just didn't have time to go through them all. The Green Amendment will come back, clean fuel standards, and a fund to set up uh, funding for local solar access. So again, that is the, um, that's the list of bills. Here is a more complete listing, and you will see this on our website. If you click on that tab that we communicated earlier, uh, you can see the bill sponsors. Um, as the bills get filed, we'll put the actual official name of the bill and uh, a handful of bills have already been pre-filed. So in those cases, the bill number and a link to the actual bill text is listed on our website and you can see those here. The one bill that we're aware of that we think needs to be opposed is gonna be in something, we haven't seen the details, but it's probably a package of bills called the Future of Transportation. And in one of those bills is a request from the New Mexico Department of Transportation for $40 million to set up hydrogen fueling infrastructure along I-40. And it is almost certainly to be uh, dirty gray hydrogen uh, manufactured from methane or natural gas with no carbon capture. So it'd be a really huge source of carbon emissions just to create a hydrogen fuel for trucks that will probably never show up um, because they will be electric trucks instead of hydrogen fuel trucks. So uh, we would like to encourage the state of New Mexico not to waste $40 million on a bunch of stranded assets for hydrogen fueling uh, along the highway. Um, there will probably be some other bills that we will oppose, uh, but that's the one that we know of so far. And then finally, um, we will all have a chance to attend the uh, legislative session in person um, on February 9th. It's called Environment Day. It is um, the same kind of thing we've done uh, at the Roundhouse for the last several years. 
uh, environmental groups from all over the state will show up and table there. And the Sierra Club will lead an activity to go do citizen lobbying at the offices of the various senators and legislators. And we will all have a chance to attend and participate and go meet our legislators in person and advocate for um, the bills that we want to see passed. This will be um, basically right before the last week of the legislature. So a very key activity and time to do that, um, that activity. And with that, uh, I'm going to open it up to Q&A. And it sounds like uh, maybe Jim has got his hand up first. So um, I'm going to just stop sharing my screen and uh, turn it over to Jim. Uh, yeah, just uh, one quick thing that uh, we didn't mention uh, directly and it segues off uh, the last thing about um, lobbying. So, and, you know, I understand that I'm actually talking to a bunch of uh, people who have probably a lot of experience with the legislature, but uh, we all need to be uh, really clear on who our senator is and who our representative is uh, when we go to Santa Fe or when we participate in any way. Uh, the most powerful uh, lobbying, the opinion that our elected representatives uh, find most valuable is their own constituents. So that means if you're in the roundhouse, uh, take a few minutes and go by the office of your representative and your senator and just stick your head in the door. And it's very difficult to get actually a sit down appointment with one of them because they're exceedingly busy. However, uh, the clerk in that office will take down your name and your opinion for or against one or multiple bills. And they keep a running tally of that. So whether you're there in person or if you call, call their office. Uh, that is a, a, actually a, a valuable input to them because they keep a running tally. Uh, they take it seriously. So for instance, if you were to look at, watch a bill hearing online and feel like you want to comment on it, call this, your representative or senator uh, and, and let them know how you feel and, and maybe why. You know, it's basically they, they tally not a lot of nuance about your opinion, but, but how you feel about it. Um, there's uh, some people feel that it, it helps to call other representatives and senators besides your own, but it, it clearly doesn't have as big an impact as talking to your own your own person. And, and you also can make an attempt uh, to uh, make an appointment. Um, you know, with a short session, uh, there's quite a time crunch, but it doesn't hurt to ask, uh, you know, I'm gonna be in Santa Fe on Tuesday and I'd like um, uh, a, a time to see my senator. Uh, so anyhow, I just wanted to mention that. It's, a, it's a good one, Jim. And let me just uh, quickly show people how to um, uh, look at the legislature and find out who your senator or legislator actually is. So across the top here, it says legislators. Click on that and click find my legislator. And you can just search for you by your address, type in your address here. It'll look you up and it'll tell you uh, who your legislator is. So very nice feature of our, of our um, website. So uh, are there any questions that people have? Um, you can either uh, type them into the chat or just uh, go off a of mute and um, chime in. Maybe raise your hand first with the hand raised tool. Uh, does anybody um, have any uh, intel on uh, on some bills that might be introduced that they've heard talk about that uh, that would be valuable that we haven't maybe covered? I think um, uh, as as Steffi 
Um, Weisberg mentioned in the chat, uh, there is various talk of legislative modernization uh, uh, bills. Uh, Stephanie, do you want to uh, talk about uh, legislative modernization? Yes, sure. Um, th there are a few bills that have been pre-filed already, um, and I haven't read them in detail, but they're basically to um, expand the 30-day session. Uh, actually, um, I think that the, uh, the number I remember is 45 days, but... Um, McQueen has a bill for 45 days each. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then uh, the pocket veto, I noticed, too. Um, so there's always that. Yep. Right. Uh, there's another one that needs to be introduced. Um, I was talking so to someone from a, a different state, and they were aghast that the governor was largely in control of the legislative agenda during this short session. Yes. It doesn't yeah. happen. That is that is part of modernization. Part of is, that is to yep. take is strip that out. Yep. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So that that would put us more in line with the other states around the country. Uh, it, it, the governor is inordinately powerful in New Mexico, which yep. you know has its pluses and minuses. Uh, of course, you know depending on who's governor and how you feel about your current governor. Um, this is like. Like the debate about the uh, filibuster in the U.S. Senate, um, it's it's good right now, but maybe not so good next time. So we'll see. Uh, I'm going to show you where uh, bills that are being pre-filed are located. So here's the legislative website. If you click under what's happening, um, oh, let's see. No, it's under home. So they have uh, some of the tweets here, which are very handy. So. The um, bills that are being pre-filed in the House are at that link right there. And you can just click that listing here and you can see these are the bills that have already been pre-filed and they got quite a, quite a listing of them. Uh, uh, Tom, go, go up to the top there of that screen. Scroll up. Uh, so we see three categories here, bills, memorials, and resolutions. And resolutions. Yeah. Um, so maybe we should, uh, they're, they're, they all have their own peculiarities. Yeah, maybe we can uncheck resolutions just to get rid of some of those. Yeah, so, yeah. so, th so they're, they're less important because they, they're not signed into law but they're but they do have importance because some of them have they have um memorials uh have sometimes directions to state agencies uh and so they they do have some impact yeah and um so some of those oil and gas act changes are listed right here so if you want to read you know the bill that talks about the liquid Spills protections. It's right here. Providing penalties for the spill and release of oil, produced water, or other non domestic uh, wastes. So that's the kind of information that you will see uh, on the, that website. The Senate has a different procedure, which is odd, but that's how they do it. And um, so the Senate operates by Google Doc. <laughs> and so this is their listing of the bills that are being pre-filed. And they don't actually assign them a bill number. They, they go by the 202 number, which is the file name for the Legislative Council Service for the bill draft. Um, and you can, but you can get to the text of the bill by clicking the link off to the side there. And it's uh, now two and a half pages of good stuff. And I see Paula has uh, her hand up. So Paula, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, I belong to Renewable Taos and have for several years. I haven't yet gone to any of the legislative sessions. 
teams. So this year, I hope to. I finally retired from other work. And I'm wondering if you have any analysis of which um, bills may be challenging this year and might require more of a physical presence than others? Or is it too early to tell? Thank you. Um, it's an interesting question. I would say, you know, one of the um, one of the unique features of the twenty of the of the short session, the thirty day session, is that the only bills that get introduced are bills that are either um, dealing with the budget or an appropriation or a constitutional amendment or bills that the governor supports because they they're not germane to the session unless she uh, sends out a message that says I support this bill and it's part of my agenda. So for that reason, there's probably fewer bills that would be in the quote unquote challenging category um, just because uh, it should be a session where at least the governor is behind uh, a lot of them. I would say that the Oil and Gas Act changes probably will be among the more challenging because they're very likely to be opposed by the oil and gas industry. So, you know, our, um, our not so friendly friends in the oil and gas sector will no doubt show up uh, to speak against them. And some of those changes uh, are really way past time. So that I would put those in that category that you're asking about. Um, uh, let's see some of the, the other hydrogen, ones. the the transportation bill. Transportation uh, is probably going to be a fight. Yeah. Because the governor is supporting that one. Um, there is another bill that um, is in the previous category. It's called HB 48 oil and gas royalty rate by uh, representative McQueen increasing the amount of royalties that the oil and gas industry has to pay for each, you know, gallon of oil that they pump, uh, cubic foot of gas that they extract. Um, New Mexico's royalty rates are among the lowest of any gas producing, oil and gas producing state, which is just a crime. Um, but they don't want to pay anymore. So that will be, um, that will be a, another fight. Those are a couple. Uh, okay, next question, Nancy, and then Beth. Uh, Nancy, can't hear you. Sorry, sorry. I just wanted to plug, I just wanted to point out, Angela also had a question in the chat. Um, but one just thing I'd like to, uh, it's a conservation bill, the Land of Enchantment uh, conservation bill that was partially funded uh, the last session and the climate connection to this is this is a bill that is basically uh, creating a fund that will invest in long term conservation land conservation rehabilitation and protection of lands and if you've been a part of any of the discussions on the 50 year water plan and the impact of climate change on our forests on our deserts on anything that is that is such a tight climate connection. We are literally losing our ecosystems as we speak, and this bill helps us to address that. So I'd just like to, just my own personal good, good uh, thing, but it's also the Food and Ag Policy Council that um, we sit in on sometimes is also supporting this um, for the reasons having to do with fires, having to do with all the different things that we know about. So just a small, uh, I think the League of Conservation Voters is carrying that, but other people will be on that too. Thanks, Nancy. That's all. Beth. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Tom, did we used to, and do we still uh, set track our bills by what is considered top priorities? So, you know, like top priorities appear earlier in the list? Yeah, um, we will. We will okay. sort them in priority order. Um, the the current list uh, is has not yet been prioritized. We're waiting to see uh, kind of the full scope of the bills that are introduced before we do that. Okay, great. And, and um, I would like to ask the same question that um, 
that Angela asked? That Angela asks as, about why did the governor in, veto the EV and solar tax credits? As in governor, what the heck? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, come on, let's get it into the the French. What the fuck? Yeah. So I would say, it, uh, my short summary is, we never really got a good answer. There are there are a whole range of uh, opinions about what it might be, and there's probably a menu of six or seven items, some of which may or be more probable. And I I just rather not go through the speculation um, here uh, because we want the governor's support this coming session. Uh, and we think we have a good chance of getting some of these through again. Um, so, yeah, Angelo. Um, I guess I'm not clear. Tom, you mentioned that the the, the bills that will um, will appear needs support of are the ones the governor would support. But if she vetoed those bills, are they still going to get reintroduced anyway? Uh, so, yes, uh, you're right. Yeah, yeah, that's a good exception. Good, good comment. Yes, Tom, go ahead. Look, um, so the 30 day session has special rules, which the only bills that are quote unquote germane, meaning they, they can fit on the agenda, are as defined by the Constitution are bills dealing with the budget or appropriations, um, or their constitutional amendments. Or that actually they are bills that the governor vetoed in a previous session. Or that are uh, accompanied by a message, which is the official term of art, a message from the governor, because the, the governor is control of the agenda for the short session, the 30-day session. So if the governor says, um, in addition to budget bills, I want this particular category of, of legislation to be... Um, <clears throat> introduced. For example, um, I think uh, there will probably be some bills uh, regarding uh, gun control uh, on the governor's agenda for the session. Then she will issue a message and saying, you know, as part of the agenda for this coming session, that particular category of bills is there. Um, so for that reason, uh, non-budget bills pretty much by definition have to have the governor's support and in a short session or else they're just not germane. They don't show up. Does that answer your question, Angel? So geothermal and solar tax credits won't appear then, won't show up? We have, so um, tax credit bills are budget bills. So those qualify, right? Um, and the geothermal bills, we have had a meeting with the governor previously, last October, and gotten her agreement to support them for geothermal. So that's a couple of different answers for those two categories. Glad to hear that. Uh, this is a good uh, illustration of the problematic nature of a pocket veto. Uh, because um, lots of people in the state have been speculating about why the governor vetoed uh, environmental bills that seemed to make sense in the context of her own messaging. But they were pocket vetoed. So we don't know even a, you know, a one sentence explanation, which is all the usual veto message is. It doesn't go on and on. It's just you know, 20 words or 15 words, but we don't even have that for the pocket veto bills. So everybody's been guessing about that. Yeah. However, she has, uh, during the course of this most recent year, come out in support of electric vehicle tax credits um, as part of her um, press releases, et cetera. Uh, as well as supporting, for example, the um, uh, New Mexico signing on to the advanced clean cars and clean trucks rules, which requires New Mexico to sell an increasing percentage of electric vehicles and trucks 
during the course of the year. So uh, there's a lot of indications uh, just going on that some of those things will have her support and uh, that she would sign them. All right, so we have some high hopes. You know, we're not going to get a comprehensive climate bill this session. It's hard to do in a short session anyway. But there are a number of good bills that make important contributions to um, climate change and public health from an air pollution standpoint and, uh, <laughs> and oil and gas spill standpoint um, that I think uh, we'd really like to support to get through this session. So it's been about an hour now. Uh, are there any questions? I guess, Jim, I see your hand up again. Yeah, just real quickly. Uh, you mentioned uh, Serenetta's um, revisions to the Oil and Gas Act. Uh, Western Environmental Law Center uh, that's based in Taos. Uh, Tennis Fox, the attorney there, uh, did a bunch of work um, on reforming the Oil and Gas Act last year. Uh, the bill didn't get very far. Um, and uh, I haven't heard, but it's possible they may attempt um, to get that in this session too. But it's a, it's a more complicated and, and has a, a greater reach than this one that was has already been pre-filed. Uh, so we may not see that uh, until uh, next year. Okay. Stay tuned. All right, are there any other questions? All right, well, with that, why don't we wrap it up for this evening and uh, wish you a happy Sunday evening and uh, we'll see you hopefully at a legislative committee hearing um, in this coming, coming weeks. Thanks everyone. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, yeah. everybody.